everyone. Welcome to a special G0 Media live stream, Plastics, Unlocking Sustainable Solutions. This event is the second session in Sustainability Leaders Summit, convened in partnership with Eurasia Group and Suntory. I'm Shari Friedman, Eurasia Group's Managing Director of Climate and Sustainability, and I'll be your host today. So on yesterday's program, we addressed Asia's role and responsibility in sustainability more broadly, including climate change. And we took a particular focus on solutions. So today we're gonna to look a little more closely at a specific facet of sustainability, plastic use, disposal, and recycling. To kick us off, I'm joined by Ian Bremer, president of Eurasia Group and G Zero Media, and Tak Nanami, CEO of Centauri, Centauri Holdings. Welcome to you both. Good. So in yesterday's session, um, similar to yesterday's session, I wanted to begin with some opening thoughts from each of you about why we're having this conversation today. And most people will recall that famous quote from the movie, The Graduate, that said, I have one word from you, for you, it's plastics. And <laughs> in fact, perhaps we didn't know at that moment how prescient that line was. You know, plastics now are everywhere. So talk, let's start with you on why you think plastic waste is an important issue of focus in terms of sustainability and also for you as a company. First of all, thank you, Shari. I love the movie. And uh, <laughs> I have to be Ben. Uh, I remember the song, uh, um, Sound of Silence. Um, this phrase reflects how plastics was becoming more and more indispensable to our daily life at that time. I don't know, maybe 20, 30 years ago, the movie was uh, uh, quite popular. And indeed, the plastics are now critical to our everyday life. And we have benefited so much from its usefulness. Um, not only for convenience, but also for the other purposes like protecting, protecting us from uh, uh, COVID-19 recently. However, we must realize we have ignored too much the negative consequences of inappropriate disposal, especially single-use plastics. In order to make the utilization of plastics sustainable, it's imperative that both the providers and the users of single-use plastics quickly change our ways toward a more circular usage that eliminates the downsides. Technology is, of course, key, and it's encouraging to see the many new technologies that are being developed to accelerate this transition. The pursuit of new technology is critical, but I'd like to point out, there's so much existing technology in place already that is waiting for application, especially in Asia. Application of technology is just as important as development because there's so much room for application. We must put in place a system in which countries, in which countries with advanced waste management systems like uh, South Korea and uh, us Japan can effectively support other countries in applying technology and designing more efficient systems. For example, we Suntory are currently developing a chemical recycling technology to recycle used plastics into new plastics together with our supply chain partners. I believe this kind of technology with, will contribute to advancing circular economy in Asia. So once developed, I have strong aspiration to bring this technology to other countries, except maybe Thailand. <laughs> but doing this requires economy of scale and the customization of technology to fit each country's situation. Because in reality, Asian countries differ so much in so many aspects, politically, economically, and culturally. To this end, the leadership and support from public sector is inevitable in realizing a circularity in nature. The private sector, especially like us, large corporations should actively play the role of bridging to help bring the technology to the communities that need it. Today, I am so honored to have specialists and expert, experts from various fields to share their insights to help us better understand this very difficult and complex issue and to provide clues 
to find the best way forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think one of your points that's particularly important is, you know, when you look at art and the new technologies, or when you look at our D&D, it's that whole chain. It's the research, it's the development, but also that it's the dissemination and how do we adopt these? And we're later on in the in the program, we're going to be talking to investors as well, which I think gets to that larger, larger point. For now, I wanted to turn back over to Ian and the same question for you and your perspective is, is there a geopolitical component to this issue? Of course there is, and uh, thank you, Sherry and, and Tack, my friends. Um, you know, uh, first of all, I, I had honestly forgotten about The Graduate until you brought it up. Um, I, I will make the point that I saw that movie for the first time in uh, 1985 when I was a freshman in college. And that line at the time struck me as the future, right? It struck me as, yeah, that was, that's kind of where we're going. And I don't think that climate climate change and diversification, I don't think that those things were even a part of my intellectual consciousness. My family certainly knew nothing about it. Um, and, and yet here we are today talking about what we can do to um, unwind uh, the damage and how we can look to a more sustainable future together. Um, and and that's, a, that's a pretty dramatic, you know, sort of arc uh, over a relatively short period of time. Um, there's no question that, I mean, everybody here understands that the plastics industry is absolutely essential to our collective well being and to our livelihoods, both in Asia, the area we're of greatest focus today, and also globally. But we also all understand that as it is presently structured, plastics and the industry and society and the infrastructure and distribution around it is literally incompatible mm. with climate targets that we have globally. And it creates huge waste problems that is enormously challenging for the biodiversity, the fragile biodiversity of our planet. And, and, and we also understand that it doesn't need to be that way, that with the right policies and with the right incentives, there can be much higher collection rates of waste plastic. And as Tax said, we have technologies to recycle a far wider range of plastic materials than we are right now, including using renewable energy, all of which goes a long way to making the industry sustainable. Um, and so... Uh, first, I guess what I want to say is it's very clear that we don't have aligned global government leadership where it needs to be. But it's also very clear that the future is going to have immense gravitational pull to get us there. The planet will force it. And the other thing that's clear, and one of the reasons why it's been so rewarding to work with Ninami-san and some of our other colleagues that are joining us today is that Tak understands that he does not want to be a laggard in this process, right? If this is where the world is going, he wants to be out in front. And, and I, as Eurasia Group and the president of Eurasia Group, I started the co this company back in 1998, not because I wanted to help companies like Suntory become more aligned with their existing mission, uh, but rather because I wanted to help us all become more aligned with the planet that we live on and where we're headed. And, and that's, that really has made this a very rewarding partnership. And, and, I, and I think it will create its own momentum. I really believe that on the back of both uh, these summits and also the work that we're putting out publicly, that it will be obvious that if others don't get on board, they're going to be left behind. And they may well be able to succeed in their original missions, but those missions will become less profitable. Those missions will become more outdated. They will be outcompeted. They will lose. Um, and so, I mean, this really isn't just about altruism for the planet. This is truly strategic self-interest. And I think that's a core part of what we're trying to talk about today and why the geopolitical challenges, as difficult as they are, are truly short-term challenges. They're not insurmountable long-term challenges. 
Yeah. So th thanks, Tak and Ian. I think that, you know, you're teeing up this conversation. You're kind of unpacking all the different pieces that we have to look at. The, you know, the technologies are there. The, the It's a complicated issue. And the, the train has left the station in terms of kind of where the globe is moving toward this. So you've got, so companies right now have the option of either being the leader, as you put it, Ian, or the laggard. So we're going to come back to both of you at the end of the program after a week unpack and discuss some of these issues. And over the course of the hour, we're going to look at the impact of plastic use, the importance of circularity and ensuring reuse, and some of these innovative solutions that were touched upon just now. Um, so we're starting off today with a new report from Eurasia Group, Unlocking Sustainable Plastics in Asia, which describes the issues we face today with plastics pollution in the region and explores possibilities for sustainable production and end-of-life solutions. Colleen King is an Associate Director of Climate and Sustainable at Sustainability at Eurasia Group. Welcome, Colleen. Oh, you're on mute. Thanks, Shari. It's great to be here. Um, and just to start off, I want to say a big thank you to everyone on our team who worked on this report, particularly Herbert Crother, and also to our sponsors, Suntory, Indorama, and JBIC for their input. Thank you, indeed. And so let's, Colleen, first, we should explain the origins of this report and why we thought it was important to look specifically at plastics. Well, the report is important because plastics are so ubiquitous. And as Anne just mentioned, they've become essential to everyday life because they provide a lot of benefits. Plastic packaging, for example, which is a focus of the report, preserves food and prevents disease. But at the same time, plastic production and disposal have negative environmental impacts. And then plastics last in our ecosystem for a really long time. So the goal of the report was to identify pathways to continue to reap the benefits of plastics while managing their downsides. This is really relevant because uh, plastics cut across a whole range of sustainability issues from climate change to greenhouse gas emissions to ocean health and biodiversity. Plastic packaging production alone is responsible for between one and 2% of total global greenhouse gas emissions, which is huge. This report calls for a cir circular plastics system economy. And if I can just take a minute to define what that means, we have linear systems where you have a product is produced, it's used and it becomes waste. And then you have circular systems where uh, after the product is used, we seek to reuse it, recycle it, put it back into the value chain and keep it sort of alive for as long as possible. When it comes to waste, we can see that unmanaged linear plastic use results in cluttered beaches, harmed biodiversity and aquatic life, and clogged urban water systems, which is more important than ever as we see these increasingly severe weather events happening all around the world. Um, so the report really looked at plastic packaging in particular as a space that's ripe for improvement. And plastic packaging accounts for around half of all global plastics production. So so that's a really good outline of kind of plastics globally. And so let's drill down specifically in Asia. And in, in what ways are, 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 did the report find that Asia is central to this story? Well, if we take a step back and look at the problem for a minute, we found that there were two options. Uh, the first is to change the trajectory of plastic packaging to manage the size of the challenge. And the second was to address the waste and emissions challenges of single use linear plastic models. Asia is important for both of those pathways. Um, Asia produces around half and consumes around 40% of the world's plastics. Uh, they also face additional challenges because they have a lot of countries with large ocean bound rivers and long coastlines. You could think of places like uh, the Philippines or Indonesia. Uh, because of these structural issues, Asia is estimated to be responsible for a far greater proportion of marine plastics leakage. And when I say that, I mean, you know, you can use your plastics if they become litter, if they're not, uh, if the waste isn't collected and recycled appropriately, they become river uh, litter, they enter rivers, and then those rivers go to the ocean. And it causes a huge problem for the health of our, of our aquatic systems. And while Asia is by no means homogenous, you do have a lot of countries where the technology exists for robust recycling systems, but the infrastructure just isn't there. We really need infrastructure to collect, sort, and recycle plastics so that once a plastic product is produced, you can keep it in the value chain for as long as possible. Then the other key uh, component we have to remember is demographics. We're expecting population and income growth in South and Southeast Asia, and the associated increases in consumption could easily overburden the current 
inadequate existing waste management systems. So you really can't ignore the region. And for those, those reasons, uh, in aggregate, the continent is usually talked about as a driver of problems rather than solutions. And so the report also the report also calls for the Asia, for Asia to lead and to become part of the solution. And this was brought up yesterday by Tak Nami, who made the point that Asia could really be the maker of international policy rather than a taker. And so in what ways is that already happening now and how could it be improved? Yeah, there are a lot of places where Asia is leading now. Uh, the report goes into several of them and I'll, I'll name a few now. You know, Japan adopted a system for end of life recycling of plastics back in 1995 that combines differentiated responsibilities for companies, consumers, and governments. I know a lot of our, our listener, listeners are in the private sector and on the private sector side in Japan, companies finance recycling costs and they have to meet these requirements to reduce the thickness and weight of their packaging on a regular basis. And the program has been remarkably successful. Uh, in 2019, they had a collection rate of used plastic bottles that surpassed 90%. And I would challenge everybody listening on the call today to go check your local collection rate because I bet it is nowhere near 90%. Uh, Korea has been a global leader in pre-collection sorting since the early 2000s. They've done a lot of work to reduce food waste. They actually have um, the system for uh, tracking household food waste that uses radio frequency identification codes on food disposal bins that allow the government to measure the success of food waste reduction campaigns in targeted areas. And they've also centralized their system to match buyers and sellers of recycled materials, which encourages an easy and transparent bidding process. And it's important to remember that it's not just the industrialized countries. There's also innovation coming from emerging markets. Uh, Indonesia is home to a number of successful NGO initiatives to improve pre-waste sorting and the limit the marine leakage that I spoke about before. And it's you can see that absent robust recycling infrastructure, you can focus on consumer behavior. behavior. And you also have to remember that uh, industrial recycling infrastructure is not in place across much of the continent, but you do have this big informal waste collection sector, the crux of which is garbage pickers who go through unsorted garbage and take recyclables to a central facility. So the context is different there from what some of our Western uh, listeners might be used to. And then we're also seeing a coordination, not just at the national level, but across the whole continent. The ASEAN uh, Regional Action Plan for Combating Marine Debris was just adopted in May 2021. Yeah, this kind of brings some of the issues that, that Ian and Tak raised earlier, both on day one and this morning, that, that in a G0 world where global leadership is absent, there's even a larger opening for Asia to become this authority if more Asian countries can overcome the problems associated with the plastic packaging and, and of use, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's our view that the space for Asian countries to work together to build either a pan-Asian approach on plastics or to be the driver of a global treaty on plastics is growing. Uh, and right now, Asian companies and multinational corporations that are working on the continent really have a real opportunity to get out ahead of consumer pressure, which is lagging in the region. Um, and sustainability commitments are an important starting point. Colleen King, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Shari. So we're going to move on and, and kind of take a look at, again, some of the solutions and the drivers for, for plastics, for solutions to plastics disposal. Plastics are everywhere in our life, which is not a surprise, of course, because they are cheap and they enable convenience. And in some cases, of course, as was noted before, they can really have huge healthcare benefits like we've seen in the pandemic. But how can we find solutions to the, to the waste problem? So joining me now are is Alok. Alok Lohia, CEO of Indorama Ventures, Rob Kaplan, CEO of Circulate Capital, and Hannah Testa, environmental activist and founder of Hannah for Change and the author of Taking on the Plastics Crisis. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. So let's start, Hannah, Hannah with you. Um, you came to this at such a young age. I, maybe people may not know this. You started activism at four years old <laughs> and really kind of came around to plastics um, at the right bold age of 10. So what did you see at that point at 10 years old that motivated you to really hone in on plastics as something you wanted to focus on? Yes, well, so when my, I always say my activism started at four years old, that was when I first really started feeling connected towards nature and understanding that 
we are really connected with the outside world. And I grew up with an organic garden in my backyard. So I could see firsthand that when you take care of nature, nature will take care of you. And going into fifth grade, and I was learning about the endangered animal species and seeing how plastic pollution was impacting the ocean animals that I loved was so devastating to hear about. And I watched a documentary and I highly recommend you watch it as well. It's called Plastic Paradise and it focuses on the plastic pollution problem in the ocean as well as its impact on human health. And that was my very first introduction towards plastic pollution. And that really, it was really unsettling. That was my first interaction with plastic pollution and I felt like my head was in the sand. I cared about animals and I cared about the planet, but I hadn't heard about plastic pollution. This was around eight years ago. So plastic pollution was not nearly as a mainstream topic as it is today. And I noticed that there was this education gap. Most people didn't even know what plastic pollution was, let alone that it was happening and that the plastics that we're using every day are contributing to this crisis. So I knew that with this education gap, if more people knew what was going on and also had resources and tools to be a part of the solution that would help mitigate the crisis that we are in today. So that's how I really first got involved with plastic pollution, seeing that lack of education awareness and helping to educate and inspire people of all ages that they can also be a part of the solution. So in your book, you write about single use plastic and the need for innovative solutions inside of the industry. And since you've been working on plastics, which is now around eight, eight years, yeah, you're 18 now, yes. right? Have you seen over, this, over the course of those years, have you seen change? And what do you think is really most notable? I've seen an immense amount of change in the past eight years. Not only has plastic pollution grown as a topic, and now it's a conversation that I think everybody has at least thought about or talked about. Uh, most people know what plastic pollution is, even when I go to restaurants and say, no plastic straw, please. A lot of the waiters and waitresses are like, oh, save the turtles. So I've started to see <laughs> over the span of just the last eight years, how much more recognition there is when it comes to plastic pollution, and especially when it comes towards the business sector and policy change. Um, a lot of the work that I do is with policy and helping to influence environmental sustainability and policy change with plastic pollution, whether it's lobbying or reaching out to representatives um, or speaking for or against different pieces of legislation, but seeing how businesses are also taking a stand and realizing that they have so much agency in the space. And a lot of consumers were lacking options around eight years ago. And now there are so many solutions out there because businesses are starting to step up and realize the urgency that we are in regarding plastic pollution, as well as climate change. And I touched on it on my book, the how interconnected plastic pollution and climate change is. People mm -hmm. don't realize that 99% of plastics is made from fossil fuels. And the production of plastic is very carbon intensive. So they're very much interconnected. So by seeing that plastic and climate are interconnected and that businesses have such a huge role in the space, um, businesses are starting to lead the way and take a change. And so there's more sustainable practices, more businesses that are trying to mitigate the plastics use that they are having or becoming zero waste wherever possible. And that is so great for consumers and activists as well, um, because there's a certain point where um, as individuals, there's so much you can do reducing your plastic footprint, but we need it. Um, this is more of a systemic change that we need. We need businesses and policy change to really get out of the plastics crisis that we are seeing. Unfortunately, over the years, I've also seen a lot of greenwashing um, businesses that are capitalizing on um, the growing concern for climate change and plastic pollution. But overall, I'm seeing a lot more businesses are being receptive um, and starting to implement more changes. This is a great moment to turn over, I think, to Alok. Um, I think you're kind of saying a call to action over to, to companies. So Alok is the, <clears throat> as the CEO of a large plastics company. What is the, what is the plastics industry doing? Some of the, some of the solutions that Hannah is uh, referring to, to currently reduce plastics pollution, both in Asia and around the world. Firstly, thank you, Hannah. And thank you, Asia, for having me on this panel. Uh, there is a lot, a uh, lot has been spoken. And I think we on the panel and in the audience recognize both the benefits that plastics brings to us and also the careless attitude we have towards the waste. Now this waste is for Indorama Ventures 
the biggest question. This is not waste. This is not litter. This is a raw material. PET bottles can be recycled and recycled and recycled. So at Indorama Ventures, we have a, in 2019, we had a budget of $1.5 billion to recycle 750 kilotons of, of waste. Actually, 750 kilotons of recycled material, which requires about 900,000 tons of waste. And our target is to get that done by 2025. And we are on track of that target. We have great alignment with our value chain from our raw metal suppliers all the way down to the shelves of the supermarkets. <clears throat> Nimani San has been very, very uh, crucial to this. And since Japan and South Korea has these, these elaborate infrastructures in place, they are great learning, learning areas for us. So for us at Indorama, we basically have a simple three-pronged strategy. One is use this raw material. You know, going forward with electric vehicles, there's going to be a lesser demand for fossil fuels. Shell has stated that they're going to reduce the refineries <clears throat> to only five, I believe. So there would be less need or less availability of fossil fuels. That itself is a challenge for the industry, especially in Asia. When I look at the other extreme, where there's going to be a good population growth, there's also going to be good income growth. Therefore, the per capita consumption of plastics or, pa or packages is going to go up. So within the themes of good demand, good, good market, and also if we can make the plastic that we produce, which is already low carbon, it is carbon generating, but it's a low carbon generating in terms of the competition, whether it's glass or aluminum or paper. So it is something that we can reuse as a raw material. That is the first thing and we can do it which we are doing it right now, which is called mechanical recycling. The second part is what Nimani San also alluded to, that is chemical recycling. Just today, one of the largest beverage companies announced that they have a prototype of 100% bio-based bottle. These technologies are coming into shape. They're not there as yet, but then that becomes a second area of generating raw material for us for this for this PET packaging. And the third one for us is we are going to deploy digital, we are going to deploy automation, we are going to improve the efficiency so that our carbon emissions in the first place reduce. So this decade till 2030 has a lot of upsides for us. Uh, Ian mentioned this, I believe, uh, there are going to be winners and losers. I hope there'll be few losers. I hope everybody will recognize the importance of this and work collectively together. I see a great potential in us, you know, being, being able to use the waste as a feedstock. And I'm looking forward to that. And I'm working with our governments, whether it is in Thailand, Indonesia, or India. And the model that Japan and South Korea has are excellent models for us to study and replicate. Yeah, I think, I think that, yes. Thank you, thank you, Alok. And, and I think you know, one of the things to point out that was alluded to, but it's probably worth pulling out is that recycling, as, as Hannah had pointed out, plastics production um, can be greenhouse gas intensive, but, but plastics recycling dramatically reduces the greenhouse gas emissions from plastics production. So, so it, it kind of addresses a couple of different things, the waste and also the greenhouse gas emissions. And I wanna move over toward to, to Rob now. And we've talked a little bit about um, that we've got the technologies and we've got the public will. And so 
how do how do we make that happen? And Rob, your investment group is called Circulate Capital, putting circularity at the heart of your mission. Can you explain the circularity as it applies to your mission and also why your investors are interested in this? And it might be worth you just explaining your model for a moment, yeah. taking a minute and explaining what you do. Yeah, Sherry, thank you very much for having me here. So Circulate Capital, we're an investment management firm. We we focus on technologies, companies, and infrastructure across South and Southeast Asia and deploy capital into these companies to help address many of the challenges we heard earlier in the program tonight um, around collection, sorting, processing. Right now, as we've seen across Asia, there's massive amounts of plastic leaking into the environment, and it's happening on the, base, the back of a linear economy, this take, make, waste economy. And you know, the limits of this economy have never been more apparent with the issues we've seen in global supply chains that are plaguing the world right now. And a circular economy can flip that on its head and can say that the resources we've used to produce all of this material are actually the resources we can use to produce the materials we need for the future. And that's where our investment strategy is focused. We've put together about $150 million from um, some of the world's leading companies, companies like PepsiCo, Procter & Gamble, Dow, Danone, Chanel, Unilever, Coca-Cola, CP Chem. And then we've combined that with leading family offices and other private investors to put investment capital to work to fight plastic pollution in countries like Indonesia and India, Thailand and Vietnam and the Philippines, where so much of this plastic is, is leaking, but it could be captured and turned into that resource. And, and so I'm going to go back over uh, to Hannah for a moment. I, I, we're, we're running a little bit late, so it would be great if we're going to, I want, I want to get to everybody one more time. So if we could just keep kind of quick questions, quick answers. Hannah, there's been some discussion yesterday about how citizens, consumers, and voters are kind of driving the change. This is your sweet spot, of course. And so can you talk a little bit about uh, how can societies be incentivized and motivated to better embrace solutions, including reuse and recycling? Great. Well, I usually talk, especially when working with young people, we hear about the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle. And I always like to add two more refuse and raise awareness, refusing single-use plastics wherever possible, um, and then also raising awareness on single-use plastics and the plastic pollution crisis. Um, and I talked about earlier the education gap that we're seeing when it comes to plastic pollution, and that, I think that's a huge driving motivator, learning about plastic pollution, why it's such a big problem in the first place, and understanding why ocean health is so important, and how we are all interconnected towards the health of our oceans, no matter how far away you are from the nearest coast. Line. We rely on our healthy oceans for um, su supporting our climate. It's the largest carbon sink in the world. So it regulates our Earth's climate. It's also a large food source for millions of people. It provides us with the water we drink, the water we rely on to irrigate the crops that we eat. So it's very important that we have healthy waters and healthy oceans. Um, and plastic pollution is, of course, a huge problem when it comes to polluting our oceans. So having that connection towards the ocean uh, for all of us, we are all interconnected to the ocean. It's also um, a huge driving factor of the amount of oxygen we breathe. Every other breath we take comes from the ocean. So by having that connection to the ocean and understanding that plastic pollution is a huge threat to the health of our oceans um, and every level in its ecosystem, is so important. Um, and educating people also on the resources available, the tools that are available for just individuals, um, people that are consumers, that are voters, or even just everyday people, how they can get involved and use the resources and tools that are available to help be a part of the solution. Um, part of that is recycling, but also to re reduce the amount of plastics that they use in their daily lives and encouraging businesses to have incentives and have initiatives in place to make it easier on consumers. It's important for consumers to vote with their wallets and support businesses that are doing well and supporting their mission of being more sustainable. And also to, of course, vote with their ballots and support uh, politicians that are voting for legislation that is better protecting our planet. So the flip side of that, of course, is, is over to a, a look and talking about companies, kind of the same question regarding companies. So how do companies become incentivized to pursue more sustainable approaches to plastics creation and waste management? Thank you, Sherry. And Hannah, you made a remarkable, uh, you know, in, 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 your, in your 
first 10 years of your adult life, you are, you are so matured. And what I would like to assure you is that companies, companies like Indorama, the top 100 chemical companies in the world, they take this very seriously. It all comes from the climate change. How are we going to keep the global warming below 1.5 degrees in this decade? And as you, as you said, they are linked with the plastics as well. Now plastics as, I don't have to repeat this, but quickly that plastics in terms of packaging is the best solution. And I don't say it lightly, I don't say it because this is not business, but this is scientific based. And why it is important and why it can be sustained is because we are going to be able to reuse the same plastic. What you said about refuse, yes, single use plastics that cannot be recycled should be refused. But plastics that can be recycled, I think we need to give them a fair chance. I think within this decade, we'll be able to use the primary plastic, which are recyclable back. Today, we already have products out there in the market with 100% recycled content in the bottles. Uh, secondly, with the chemical recycling just around the corner, we'll be able to use 100% of what we are able to collect. Yes, the challenge lies with the collection, but we all are working towards that. Yes, the leakages that happen with the small villages or towns along the, along the rivers that seep into the ocean, that's terrible. We all recognize it. And we all are making efforts on trying to improve on that. And that's a public-private partnership that we all are uh, aligned with. So we are working on this very hard. I think the industry is mature enough to understand the consequences. This is a change. And whenever there's a change, there's an opportunity. We've gone through this change. We went from coal to natural gas, now from natural gas, for us to move into a, a product, which can be a raw material as well. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's very exciting for us. My son, who's 35 years old, he's leading this charge. I would love to get you two together so that he can explain to you what all we are doing. But it's a young people's destiny. It is something that they will work on best. And I'm very fortunate that this family company of Indorama, my three kids, with the youngest being at 28, they all are working on this. They're part of the company and they are going to make the investment decisions going forward. So since they're very clear on what they want to invest in, today, Indorama, everything we are investing in, we invest about $2 billion a year. A bulk of that is going into sustainable projects. So moving over, I mean, what we're hearing is that there is a an impetus to move over toward the solutions. And Rob, this is kind of you know where your company, where your company focuses, and your mm -hmm. your investments are largely focused in solutions for emerging market countries. So you have a particular viewpoint on the intersection between the solutions and also development, which is something we haven't quite talked about yet. So my question to you is: Can plastics? be a solvable problem without hindering economic development? Yeah, thank you, Sherry. You know, we have been focused on emerging markets um, largely because it's where most of the plastic leaks into the environment. And it's also where most of the economic growth will occur over the next and coming decades. But this waste and recycling sector, the infrastructure that's required to really solve this plastic problem, the plastic leakage problem, is massively underinvested. And that creates a unique opportunity for investors. We've started to find incredible companies and entrepreneurs across the region who have um, basically been sp small, medium enterprises, family businesses that have never had the opportunity for growth, that have built a profitable business trading in plastic and some of the highest recycling rates in the world in places like Indonesia, in uh, large cities in India, and what we found is that there's a unique opportunity today to put capital to work. An example is a company in India um, called Trishakra Polyplast that is building the first um, food grade bottle to bottle recycling facility in India. 
Today, every recycled plastic, PET plastic is imported because there's been never built a bottle to bottle recycling facility. Proven technology just needs to be executed and executed at scale. And so here's a company that's bringing that in, using capital to do it and um, building off of the strong foundation of a profitable business. That's, that's growth opportunity and that's a strong potential for investment return and also return on impact that creates jobs and um, economic development in the communities where they're operating. So thank you. I think that that's a really great note to leave on. And Hannah, Hannah Testa, Alok Lujia, Rob Kaplan, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Sherry. Okay. So up next, what does the future look like for plastics industry, both in Asia and everywhere? I'm joined now by Sean Kidney, CEO of the Climate Bonds Initiative, and Tadashi Maida, Governor of the Japan Bank for International Cooperation. Welcome to you both. Thanks, so, Sherry. Sean, let's start off with you. Um, can we just first start talking about what the Climate Bonds Initiative does? Look, we're a global NGO mobilizing capital for climate action, including, as Hannah points out, action on plastics, because it's totally linked to climate change. We've had a bit of success so far. We've grown in the last 10 years from a $10 billion instrument to a 2.5 trillion US dollar uh, market. Uh, and it's growing very fast, 80% per annum. And on the back of that, we've got a whole lot of government action, regulation in China and in Europe and soon to be in the US to support this market and support the shift of capital flows. And most importantly for today's conversation, we have extraordinary engagement with investors now around the world, especially in the last two years, who are finding their clients love this stuff and they want to shift their money. And they want to shift their money with confidence into things, into assets and projects will make a difference to the world we live in and, of course, reduce their long-term risks because what they see with climate change especially is if the kind of volatility we're going into, they're not going to be able to match their assets and liabilities. They're going to lose money, as the Institute of Actuaries tells them all the time. So there's a straightforward portfolio reason for action, but they're keen. That's our opportunity. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing that we keep hearing as a business case. This is not like, this is not for that there's a confluence between what a, a bigger confluence than we've seen before between what is good environmentally and what is good business wise and so while we're talking about the future right now what kind what types of investments are you looking at technology companies innovations that can move the needle on the plastics issue well what we're looking at is standards globally in in china europe and other countries for what can be called a sustainable or green investment to guide investors. And in that context, well, the first thing to say is things are pretty bad. You know, things are pretty bad. It's not just climate change. It's also the unbelievable biodiversity destruction that we are currently experiencing. We're, we're in the middle of the sixth great extinction on this planet, except this time humans have created it. It's a rather unusual own goal. And part of that is the is the contribution to pollution in the environment. Plastics is a big part of that, unfortunately. You know, it has been, and I can still remember taking my family skin, uh, snorkeling off the west coast of Bali and coming out of seeing some fabulous fish into what can only be called an acre of plastic. They will never go to Bali again, even though they're typically, because of the experience is so ugly. You know, that's the, that's the personal experience. But of course, the macro experience is the destruction of habitat, destruction of species. So we've got to do something, you know, and it's, and it's really urgent because the biodiversity destruction that we're currently experiencing is going to start affecting us in food chain, in crops, in a whole lot of environmental issues, which provide the enabling environment for us to live and survive. So it's urgent. What we're looking at is three layers, really. Um, decarbonizing. There is a decarbonizing of the oil production system that we can do. There's work done. The second area of decarbonisation is in feedstocks. So the critical area is the switching olefin production to biofeedstocks and degrade oil. And, and I know that um, uh, we've got some very interesting stories popping up at the moment, including from the previous speaker. And lastly, but not leastly, usage. You know, we do need to radically change our usage. Let's be clear. It's we need to reduce and recycle. We, we're not going to be able to extinguish the use of plastics. Of course not. It's so useful. It will go to biodegradable. 
and it will go to, to inputs that are different. But we can reduce a lot and we can recycle. I mean, our recycling efforts, frankly, are utterly terrible. Now, I'm not going to comment on exactly what we do to recycle, but there are, because there's many different ways in different countries, there's experiments around the world, but goodness knows what we have to do. So in the European taxonomy of sustainable finance, which will guide all definitions of Europe in sustainability for Europe, for investors, banks, and corporates going forward, the recycling of plastics is absolutely seen as a green and sustainable investment. But we are also, because I want to come back to this, look at inputs. Essentially, the whole feedstock regime has to change. And it has to change not just in the short, and like not just in a few industries, it's got to be everything. And we've got to do it fast. We just don't have time to mess around. There's been a lot of talk, a lot of talk for 10 years, not enough action. Whew, yep. Time to change. Yeah, indeed. And, and so I think that that's a good lead in over also to to Tadashi, and I should ask you also first to explain the work of JBEC on, on a global stage, and, and then we'll get to kind of the intersection between what JBEC does and what, what the Climate Bonds Initiative does. Yeah, it's hard to tell you that JBEC is a government-owned, 100% government-owned uh, financial institution. However, it's a autonomous tree managed by board of directors, which I chaired. And under my governorship, the uh, mission and mandate of, uh, of JBEC has been transforming quite substantially uh, from the traditional export credit agency model to developing financial institutions. We are more uh, face up to global issue agenda like uh, sustainability and climate change and the biodiversity as well. And also that we are the function of, uh, we have a function of uh, the uh, 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 kind of national security issue and also the uh, master of economic statecraft on a geoeconomic issue. Therefore, that most recently uh, under the framework of uh, Quad, uh, 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 the partners with a like-minded country like uh, United States and India and Australia, we are working on very strategic project. Uh, in particular, in a uh, uh, island nations in, in the Southern Pacific, so that these countries is now, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, battery damaged by COVID and also that the uh, ocean prop, ocean contamination, the plastic as well. Therefore, we are going to make outreach to those host countries to provide the show that some of uh, solutions which we can contribute and also main function of JBIC is to mobilize the private funds as a catalyst. So that, that's a, a key role. And uh, our, our scope of operation is uh, quite flexible uh, from debt financing to equity investment and a guarantee operation that the uh, an equity operation investment we are also funding for the starts up as a uh, uh, general partners we are uh, mobilizing the private capital to foster the starts up in and also to try to deploy those technology to that the social agenda that's our uh, main function Right. So it sounds like the, this concept of mobilizing private capital is is what you're really focused on. And of course, that kind of gets into where Sean is working. And before we go back over to, to this interaction between you and Sean, I just wanted to also um, ask you the same question I asked to Sean, which is what are the specific solutions as somebody who's, who's um, incentivizing the solutions? What are these solutions that you're going after? And, and also, if you could also speak to, you know, the, the need for greater sustainability and drastic reduction in carbon emissions and the kind of how this might be affecting your business moving forward. Uh, sorry, Tadashi, this is to you. Sorry, sorry, it's my... <laughs> uh, uh, Japan, the business has a lot of, uh, you know, potential technology to contribute to solve this problem, uh, those uh, global issue. However, the many of the private corporates are... Uh, Discoversive and reluctant to take a risk, uh, especially to fostering a new technology is a, a key, very uh, uh, you know uh, risky. Therefore, that we're going to uh, avoid any conflict with those, uh, for those uh, Japanese private company with uh, some risk. And also for the purpose of this, uh, we have uh, uh, capacity to make outreach to host countries. Uh, for example, that uh, Indonesia, like Vietnam, they have 
uh, still uh, they have a lot of, lot of uh, dependency of, of fossil fuel, especially coal. Uh, even uh, uh, by to, uh, 2040, the Indonesian will depend the uh, more than 50% of coal, or so of uh, power. And Vietnam is on, on the same figures that uh, they in 2040. Therefore, that the uh, many of the financial uh, institu financial institution and industry will make a divestment. However, divestment itself is not solution. So that we need to provide some solution by engaging and make outreach to the host countries. And uh, we need to make some of the uh, plan or programs which uh, uh, acceptable, which is acceptable to the host countries. So, uh, in 2019, before COVID, I had a, a meeting with a, a Vietnamese prime minister and, and we make a, a proposal to them and then to make a, a real change, it happened. So and I'm hearing a drive from both of you to really make the change. And both of you guys are, are in this solution space. So I'm gonna ask again, the same question um, to both of you, perhaps starting first with Sean and then moving over to Tadashi. Um, how do you see this interaction between the public and the private partnerships on climate action, specifically around plastics? I mean, Sean, where are you seeing the opportunities for this? So you, you're perfectly right in saying that the scale of the change we need to make and the speed of the change that we need to make requires a close working relationship between public and private. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. It's not going to be just the Coca-Cola of the world changing, although that's incredibly important. And the leadership we're hearing this week from uh, Coca-Cola, I think, is quite is very interesting development. But you know, we need to do a lot more than that in a lot of different sorts of areas. So it's a very big agenda. We, we talk about two formulas here. We talk about first, make it easy to know what to do. We have to understand the relevant necessary ambition. And it isn't true that a little bit of good is still a help. Sometimes by doing a little bit of good, you block what really needs to happen. So we need to understand what we really need to do here. Where, the way we've tried to do it is work with the European Commission and with China, China the People's Bank of China on what are green taxonomies or green definitions that is sort of like investment grade green determines. And that includes plastics, by the way. So plastics investments that are adequately ambitious need to be clarified, and put out there. Once we've done that, then we need to look at how we preference or bias towards those investments. That includes, by the way, lower cost capital. It's a really important, particularly in, in Southeast Asia. And that's where JBIC comes in because, you know, JBIC has done this for many years, preferencing, supporting policy, public priority, priority investments. I've got an argument with some of the investments that JBIC has been asked by the Japanese government to support in the past, coal, for example, but they've changed. They're now looking at a whole bunch of green investments that they will support with JBIC tools. Now, that is what we need, more of that. So we've got to get the, let's call it the taxonomy or the rules clear up front so everyone knows what they're doing. And we're singing from the same song sheet around the world. And then we need to get all our tools, the public sector, to make sure capital is de-risked or, or a lower cost capital, especially in high interest rate environments, shifting. And that's how we do it. And that's how we've done it for the last 200 years in every area of development of this economy. That's how we got to the world we've got in. We just got to focus it now green. Right. So, so a couple of threads from what you're saying. One is like, be laser focused on what the end prize is and don't waste your time on, on, you know, what we used to call mosquito bites when I was working in investment, on, you know, around the smaller pieces and, and also you know, moving along with the change, noting that, you know, where the way that you've done it before doesn't necessarily have to be the way that you, you do it today. And, and this kind of leads us back over to Tadashi and the way that JBIC has changed its investment strategy. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the levers. You spoke a little bit about de-risking capital and if you could focus specifically on, you know, how that, that might look like in climate change and how you can use, how you can mobilize the private sector capital collaboratively. Uh, for example, that we already uh, have done a two uh, investment uh, with a, uh, a startup, a Japanese startup, with the battery technology uh, uh, for the purpose of the uh, output adjustment in, in Europe, which is one thing. Uh, normally, that startup company does not have a cash flow injury, therefore, it's 
quite uh, tough for many uh, financial institutions to uh, make a, a, a debt financing. Therefore, that the uh, as alternative, we're providing the equity, and then the uh, work together with a with a startup, and also uh, through that formulation or creating a, a investment fund. Uh, uh, focus on startup and, and cross A, B, and very early stage of the of uh, of uh, tech, of uh, entrepreneurs, and we are going to uh, foster them uh, and uh, to monetize these technology. Uh, for the future. And also uh, we, uh, our capacity is the engagement with the host countries. And uh, host co without engagement with host countries, the, uh, you know, we, ha we have uh, uh, worked on many projects in PPP, but many uh, uh, host countries government to misunderstand the meaning of the PPP. It means that for uh, leave everything to the private sector, it is not work. And Therefore, PPP that, is a public private partnership. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. so they feel that public means that public uh, financial institution like JBIC. That is, not, it is not true. Therefore, that uh, all of the uh, efforts could be combined by by the uh, host countries and to take the share share in burden and responsibility. But the many countries uh, face uh, fiscal uh, deficit and constraint, especially as uh, being uh, uh, you know widen this gap between the uh, because of the COVID nineteen. And therefore, that uh, this is a, t a tough time and challenging for both uh, developing countries and uh, and the developed countries as well. Therefore, that all partnership means that the uh, we are going to be in the same boat, and the sharing the responsibility, and that uh, we need some guidance to how to share the responsibility. So that it is, I think that it's a, uh, our law to give some guidance to to materialize in uh, PPP programs successfully. Thank you. I have so many more questions for both of you, but we are going to have to move on. And so I'd like to thank both Sean Kidney and Tadashi Maida. Thanks to you both for joining us. Thank you. Finally, we've only got um, a couple of minutes left, but I'd like to very briefly bring back uh, Ian Bremer and Taknanami, who have been holding on, and I can see them nodding a lot as everybody's speak, speaking. Um, and I'd like to just get some reactions from what we heard. Let's go first over. Um, Ian, let's start with you. Sure. Look, I, I mean, for me, the most important thing uh, we have, you know, uh, Tadashi, my old friend, uh, representing, uh, you know, the, the public sector and the Japanese government. Uh, we had an environmental activist. We have, you know, sort of people that are engaging from finance and from corporates and, you know, sort of all, all the way through the distribution chain. And, and what we see in every piece of this conversation is a lot of recognition oh, yes, of that we are not doing enough um, and that momentum is is happening. Um, and, I mean, you know, uh, Tadashi is the person here that I've known the longest. Uh, I met him when he was first the JBIC representative in Washington, D.C. Um, I, I mentioned at the opening of all of this that in 1985, I wasn't aware climate change was a thing. When I first met Tadashi, JBIC was a completely different organization. And it was investing in radically different stuff. And today, they're no longer part of the climate change problem. They're increasingly trying to become a part of sustainability. Uh, I, when I was with my friend Antonio Gutierrez, the Secretary General of the UN, one of the things he was most excited about over the last year was how much faster the Japanese government, who had been laggards on coal financing, were actually willing to be seen as leaders. That's, that's a pretty big statement, right? And so, I mean, my real hope here uh, is that we can use this group. This group isn't everybody, but this group is a good reflection of what leadership in different parts of, of our planet today that are involved with plastics can actually do if we put our minds to it. And, you know, frankly, uh, I'm hoping that this isn't just going to inspire others around the world. I hope it's also going to shame some of those around the world and recognize that if they don't get on board um, with projects like the one that we, that Tak and I and the rest of us are leading today, that we're not going away. Uh, we're just going to keep working and they're not going to be a part of the solution. So I, I really am. I've been quite um, enthusiastic 
uh, to see the level of both engagement and the level of alignment. I mean, given how incredibly diverse uh, and dispersed the plastics economy is, we're not just talking about one set of players. It's not just like, okay, oil companies and coal, you've got to stop that, and now we can reduce carbon. This is an incredibly difficult uh, problem to unwind, and we have to move to action, and we have to do it together. Uh, this is not a place where, you know, one leader in one part of the industry can make it happen themselves. And I, I think the good news that we're seeing from today and from yesterday is that there are people across this very diverse set of challenges that are actually on the same side. Uh, so uh, that's, that's a few moments for me. Thank you, Ian. Um, talk, any final thoughts from you? Thank you, Shari. It's been an inspiring and insightful today's session. I'd like to thank all the speakers and the participants for the great discussions. Um, as we learned over the course of today's, we see so much difference in policies, economic development, the consumer sentiment and the culture among, uh, among uh, various countries and uh, regions. We learned from uh, Kevin Rudd and Ian Brema on day one, that the world already has sufficient uh, science, scientific knowledge already, and a significant technology to effectively progress toward the achievement of the 2050 goals. What we don't have is the leadership. I think they expressed the situation as a huge leadership deficit. I believe Asia has the potential to fill that leadership role in tackling the climate issues like LOC. And also the plastic problem as was discussed today. There's no denying that Asia is the, at the center of problem, but we must also become the center of the solution. Up until now, Europe has taken the lead in environmental policy and the rulemaking. I strongly believe Asia should take action now so that uh, we are not left out of the, this conversation. For Asia to take the lead in tackling environmental issues, the politics and the policies and the discussions must truly really reflect Asia's reality. We have established this Sustainability Leader Council together with the Eurasia Group led by Ian Brema. He talked about that now with the aspiration to facilitate such a real discussions to find the actionable solutions with a particular focus on nature. So, I'd like to invite more companies, like-minded companies and like-minded organizations who share the same um, ambition, but maybe different perspectives to join us, like Indorama, like uh, 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 JBEC, in contribute to making real progress in Asia's sustainability agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you both Ian Bremer and Tak Um, What we're really hearing, I think, from you is that this conversation, this isn't you know, about putting on an event. This is really about action and the Sustainability Leaders Council doesn't end here today at the end of this session. This keeps going on with a call for others to join to actually find actionable solutions. So thanks to you both. This concludes our Sustainability Leaders Summit. We'd like to thank Indorama and the Japan Bank for international cooperation as council members who provided input for today's discussion, and of course, Centauri. And you can learn more about the issues we've discussed and also watch yesterday's live stream on demand at g0media.com slash sustainability. I'm Shari Friedman. For all of us, I'd like to thank you for watching and wishing you a lovely rest of today.